Hello, uh, good afternoon um, and welcome to this latest uh, elective session at the ELT Conference Teachers Day. Um, if this is your first session, then um, a big welcome to the conference. Um, if you've been with us for uh, other parts of today or yesterday, then thanks for, for staying with us. Um, I hope you found it as meaningful and important and as uh, inspiring as, as I have um, sitting watching. Um, if you don't know me, my name is Tim, um, Tim Barker. I'm the Business Development Director at English UK, um, and it's a big welcome from me. Um, uh, we're able to offer this conference for free and to teachers from all, and practitioners from all over the world um, with big thanks, really, to our sponsors. It's, we wouldn't be able to do this without the support of, of our sponsors, um, and they are all doing fantastic work in, in various different parts of ELT. So a big thank you to Cambridge Assessment English, um, to ENDS the Insurance, to Language Cert, to Macmillan Education, and to Trinity College London, um, for your support and for everything that you do for the ELT industry, please do go and check out what they do. Um, if, if you do have a, a question or comment at any point, please do put it in the comment box. Um, if you could start maybe by just sharing uh, where you're calling in from today, it'd be interesting to see how global an audience we've, we've got today. So please just put your name um, and your country in the comment box. Um, uh, I'll start by saying I'm Tim and I'm calling in from um, from North London. Um, if something does happen to the uh, Wi-Fi um, of uh, either me or our speaker, then uh, we may drop out, then please just be patient, try the original link, um, and it will be back up as soon as possible. Um, that's that's it. That's all I'm going to say, um, other than to um, introduce Chia. Um, some of you will have um, seen what she introduced at our plenary. Um, uh, really, really interesting and intriguing topic of um, uh, conversation and presentation this afternoon. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Chia um, to introduce herself and introduce her topic. Over to you, Chia. Hello, hi. <laughs> Hello, hi. <laughs> My name is Chia, Chia Sun Chong, and um, to start with, let me try and share my screen with you. Um, so let me know if you can see my screen right about now. We got it. Brilliant. Anyway, we're here today for a, quite a quick session about what it means to teach culture in the English classroom. So I'm going to get right to it. I'm a communication skills trainer and an intercultural skills trainer. And for years, I've been advocating that we need to bring um, the soft skill, the life skill of uh, intercultural skills and intercultural awareness into the English teaching classroom. But what do we mean by teaching culture? I remember speaking to a uh, teacher trainee once and uh, I brought up this topic, the how important it is for us to teach culture. She quickly agreed with me and then said, I teach culture in my classrooms all the time. Just a few weeks ago, I decorated my classroom with the, with the Union Jack, the, the, the flag of the United Kingdom. And I talked to my students about the British royal family. And we learned about the hierarchy of the, the royal family and British history. For her, that was what it meant to teach culture. For us, for some other students and for many ELT course materials, teaching culture perhaps might mean learning about the festivals of different countries around the world, the food they eat, the costumes they wear, um, their dance, their traditions perhaps. Those all constitute teaching culture, but what exactly, what else do we mean when we say teach culture. If you look at a lot of ELT materials, you might see something that looks like this. We talk about teaching interpersonal skills like relationship building or trust building, and, and you might have language gambits, functional language on how to make small talk. This one caught my attention, particularly because I felt that the strategies on how to make small talk here were very much based on an English or perhaps British or perhaps even Western perspective of making small talk. You see, I come from Singapore. I was brought up in Singapore and I came to live in the UK when I was in my early 20s. Um, and the question, how old are you and what's your salary was quite a common way of starting small talk alongside what did you have for lunch? 
perhaps the way we make small talk is different from country to country, from culture to culture. But you say, we're teaching English. Shouldn't we be teaching English culture or British culture or American culture because that's the target culture of the target language? English is used as the global lingua franca today. It is used as this tool for communication all around the world. You might have a Peruvian businessman talking to a Korean businessman in English. Neither of them speak English as a first language and neither of them really know much about the British culture or need perhaps need to know anything about the British culture. What then does this mean for them? Let's have, a, let's have a little think about these different topics of small talk. Which ones do you consider acceptable? Which ones make you uncomfortable? In the chat field, if you can, um, do type in your answers. Which ones do you often use to make small talk? The weather for Fillmore, for example. Yes, thanks, Fillmore, for participating. We're going to use the chat field lots today, the chat box a lot today. So do have your fingers ready on your keypad or your keyboard um, because I'll be asking you lots of questions. Um, some of you might say that asking about someone's parents' health is a, a big taboo. We do not say that um, when meeting someone for the first time. However, someone from a different culture might say, hey, that's what we talk about all the time, our parents' health. Um, your age might be important depending on the language or your first language. Um, in Vietnamese, for example, knowing someone's age, knowing your conversations partner's age might make a bit big difference in the way you address them. So how old are you is really quite an essential question to ask if you're speaking, if, if two Vietnamese people are speaking to each other, for example. So what is culture? Very often I find that with my students, my clients, and even with fellow teachers, when we talk about culture, their minds instantly turn to a list of do's and don'ts. In Japan, do this, but don't do that. Now, there's nothing wrong with do's and don'ts as such. They are useful, they're handy, and they allow people to feel sort of in control of the situation, like they could, you know, know what to do when they're speaking to someone from a different culture. So what's the problem with them? They often cover a very superficial view of culture. They're very easily searched online. So to be honest, why pay someone like myself money to, to, to do a session about intercultural awareness when you could find this information very, very easily on Google? Some of these items are really easy to do. If I said to you, bring a gift when visiting someone in Japan, you would say, yeah, sure, why not? That's easy. I'll bring a gift. However, if I were to say to you, slurp when eating noodles in Japan, you might find that a little bit more uncomfortable to do. After all, there are certain things that we are so used to doing, that we're so familiar with, that when asked to do something different, it might almost feel like we're sacrificing a part of our identity in doing this. And then there are things like bow when you meet someone or use both hands when accepting business cards that, that you might think, oh, I could do that. And then in the moment, in that situation, you might feel kind of uncomfortable or you might forget to do those things. But these are just, you know, superficial. These are easy to deal with. If you forget to bow, practice bowing, for example. But culture does go beyond these national stereotypes, these do's and don'ts. Cultural filters could include things like your corporate culture, the company you're from. People within a company, say if you're from the IT department, you might, for example, um, have a very different culture, very different behavior from someone from the sales department. Your gender, your age, your religious affiliation, your political affiliation, all these things could influence your values, your attitudes, your beliefs, and which in turn then influences your culture, so-called. But remembering that culture isn't a static, fixed object or concept. Culture is dynamic. It's fluid. We adapt day to day, depending on the context, depending on who we talk to. 
We talk to our parents differently from the way we say talk to our colleagues or our boss or our students or our friends at the pub. We are adaptable by nature. And culture works in interesting ways because we do adapt and, and we allow culture to be fluid, really depending on where we are and the context we're in. Here's an example of that. I remember going to my first ERT conference about, what is it, 16, 17 years ago, and watching all these great ERT presenters present. And I had my notebook with me and I would take notes on, you know, what these great presenters were doing and what I could learn from them to become a better presenter. I would write, okay, use lots of images, not too much text on your slides, font size at least 24, uh, <laughs> lots of group work, lots of pair work, lots of interaction, and some humor. Uh, it's always good when a presenter's entertaining the audience. I then started to practice these what I thought were good presentation skills, I would hone them and try to mold myself into these good presenters that I had watched. I became what I thought was a fairly good presenter. When I finished my master's, I was given the opportunity to present my research in an academic conference in Istanbul. Filled with confidence, I took these, you know, these, these notes with me. I prepared a presentation that was full of images, some humor, lots of group work, lots of pair work. I went to the conference and I started to watch other people's presentations. These academics were doing things quite differently. There was PowerPoint slide decks that were full of words, lots of text, font size 12. There was a lot of lecturing. There was absolutely no pair work, no group work, and certainly no images and humor. I was sitting there watching these presentations, feeling quite smug, thinking to myself, wait till they see my presentation. I'm gonna be so dynamic. I'm gonna blow their minds. Imagine the shock I had when I presented and they all looked at me like I was insane. I asked them to work in pairs, to work in groups. And instead of enthusiastically taking on the task, they sat there and stared at me as if to say, what? We have to work, but we're the audience. I was making jokes, attempting to entertain the audience and they all just looked rather disgusted. What I had experienced was really a form of culture shock. My assumptions of what made a good presentation might have been right for the English language practitioners conference, but they were certainly not the same criteria that academics were following in an academic conference. What I had not realized is that the culture of one industry could really differ so, so widely from the criteria of a good presentation in a totally different industry. Carl Rogers, the psychologist said, being empathetic is seeing the world through the eyes of the others or the other, not seeing your world reflected in their eyes. We often say, you know, put yourself in someone else's shoes in order to understand them. But perhaps the saying really should be, put yourself in someone else's shoes, wear their clothes, live their life, and then can you see the world reflected in their eyes? It can be so easy to have those cultural filters blind you to other ways of seeing the world, to other perspectives, to other ways of behaving and doing things. Maggie is an example of a company that has very successfully seen the world through their customers' eyes. So in the chat field, where is this company from? If you know the company, Maggie, where are they from? Very, very quickly, are they, which country? Which country were they? Where, where did they originate? Lachlan says Switzerland, Jane, Italy, Leanne, Indonesia, South Korea says Amanda. Okay, very, very different answers I'm getting. I once wrote a blog post about this and um, many of my Singaporean colleagues and Malaysian colleagues said, Maggie, obviously Maggie's from Singapore. You know, Maggie noodles, everyone knows Maggie instant noodles. A Filipino colleague based in Europe wrote me a private message saying, no, 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 
Maggie's from the Philippines, I'm sure of it. An Egyptian teacher trainee then said to me, no, Maggie's from Egypt. It's, 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 it's true, I know it for a fact. And my German students were all insistent that Maggie's from Germany. Maggie is great at globalization. In a time when, you know, companies and big corporations try to, to globalize their products and sell them across the world, perhaps the successful ones are the ones like Maggie who are able to adapt to the local culture, who are not only able to know the local culture, but are able to adapt to them. So much so that people from those cultures became convinced, convinced that Maggie was from their country. What a great example of localization. McDonald's does it really, really well too. McDonald's in Singapore might have buttermilk crispy chicken on their menu, but McDonald's in Japan has teriyaki burgers with an egg in their menu. In India, the localization really depends on the region you're in. In some parts of India, you could find dosa masala burger, but in other parts of India, you would find a Mexican makalu tiki. And in Germany, where eating meat is becoming increasingly frowned upon, the big vegan burger has become very, very popular. Another great example of localization. I'm finding myself in that need to constantly adapt to, just like McDonald's, just like Maggie. I'm married to someone who's from Ireland and I'm from Singapore. I spent most of my adult years in the UK. He spent most of his adult years in Germany. Our communication styles can be quite different sometimes. I remember when we first started living together and he said, um, he, he would take, put his shoes, he'd take his shoes off and then he would put his socks on the floor. And I would say, honey, what, why are your socks on the floor? He would then proceed to give me this blow by blow account on how he took his socks off and, and, and then his, his, his feet felt really warm. And then he, he was holding a shoe in one hand. And so he would have to put his other sock on the floor. And I said, stop there, please stop. I'm not asking for an essay about why, why you took the socks off. I'm asking you to put the socks in the laundry basket. He looked at me and said, you're being a bit insidious here. If you wanted me to put the socks in the laundry basket, then say, put the socks in the laundry basket. Why tell me, why ask me for the reason why I put the socks on the floor? We were experiencing a intercultural misunderstanding. Perhaps this is because he's Irish and I'm Singaporean. Perhaps it's because he spent his time in Germany and I in the UK where people are less direct. Perhaps it's because he's male and I'm female. Perhaps it's all of the above. Whatever it is, we were suffering from what I call the illusion of transparency. It's the tendency to overestimate the degree to which our mental state is known to others. Sorry, what? <laughs> to put that simply, we always know what we mean. And so we expect others to know it too. We do this all the time, don't we? You know, we've talked about the present perfect 17,000 times. And so when we are approaching a class and explain the present perfect, we almost kind of feel like, don't you already know this? Shouldn't you know this just by a one sentence explanation from me? We almost expect people to read our minds. And it's so important in intercultural communication that we remember the illusion of transparency and the importance of clarifying what we mean and asking for clarification because we don't always know what people mean, and we certainly don't always know the intentions behind what they mean, or the beliefs, the values, the attitudes that underlie what they do. Here's another example of the illusion of transparency. You're working at a cafe, a customer comes up and asks for coffee, right? You don't understand this customer. You see this gesture with his thumb and index finger, you hear the word coffee. So how many cups of coffee do you serve him? In the chat field, is it two? A for two, B, seven, C, eight, or D, none. You think he's being aggressive and you call for your manager. Amanda, thank you very much for the, being the first to answer. Amanda says seven cups of coffee. Zofia, C, eight cups of coffee. Jeff says two cups of coffee. So does Miliki. D, 
well, yes, aggressive, because really that's the sign of a finger finger gun. Yeah. Um, Fillmore too. You can see so many different answers in the chat field right now. And it just really goes to show you that gestures are really not universal at all. This really happened to a client of mine, a German client who went to China on holiday with his wife and asked for two cups of coffee this way, because in Germany, this is too. The waiter turned up with eight cups of coffee because eight ba in Chinese is signified with this symbol. In Singapore, in Taiwan, and in some places, this is seven. And in the UK and in America, this is just the gun. Here's another one. You're giving a presentation. You look out into a sea of people and everyone looks really serious. Not a single person smiling. You think A, they don't like your presentation. B, they're very, very serious. C, they're very focused on what you're saying. Or D, they want to show you and the event respect. Milike says C, okay. D for Jane, C for Amanda. It's easy, isn't it, when you're presenting and you're kind of expecting people to be smiling and nodding at you because that's what you're used to. And you end up with a sea of people looking at you with very serious faces. Even if you're really culturally aware, some part of you might start to feel really insecure. And I know, I know I would start to think, oh, they don't like me very much. I think they hate me. They look very serious. In Russia, there is a proverb that goes something like, smiling without reason is a sign of idiocy. In other words, if you smile and don't have a reason to, for smiling, then you must be an idiot. Smiling can mean so many different things and could be used for so many different reasons, depending on your context and depending on your culture. Smiling could be used to mask nervousness. Smiling could be used to show confidence, to show that you are being extra friendly and you might smile a bit too much doing that. Smiling could be used because you want to convey good information, good news. Here's another example of the illusion of transparency, again, very much based on reality. And this was done by someone I know who did some research in Germany, looking at a business meeting between an American person and a German person. So Ed, the American, is presenting his business idea to Katrina. I'm going to give you a couple of seconds to read this on your own because I don't want to taint this with my voice or my intonation. So go for it. And then think about what Ed might say about Katrin after this meeting and what Katrin might say about Ed after this meeting. And when you're ready, type your answers in the chat field. So the researcher took Katrin and Ed out of the room separately after this meeting. The researcher turned to Ed and said, so how do you think that meeting went? Denise here says, Katrine is always finding problems, perhaps because of her repetitive, repetitive use of the word problem. Um, Lachlan says, Ed is indecisive perhaps, and Ed might say that Katrine is arrogant. Yeah, okay. And Jane, Jane, you're spot on actually, because that's exactly what Ed said. Ed said, oh, Katrine is so negative. Everything I suggested, she just kept saying, the problem is, the problem is, the problem is, she's a negative person and so difficult to please. I kept changing my proposal and she just kept saying, the problem is. The researcher then took Katrin out of the room and asked her, well, how do you think the meeting went? Katrin said, you know what? I really loved Ed's business idea. It was fantastic. I was really interested in it. Katrin was saying the problem is repeatedly because she was interested in Ed's idea. To Katrin, she wanted to explore the idea thoroughly, precisely because she was interested. She wanted to really understand the pros and the cons, the advantages and the disadvantages because she was interested. And she thought that Ed knew that. She wasn't trying to be critical at all. Now, there is no right or wrong in international communication like this, because to be honest, when a, mis a misunderstanding like that happens and a business deal falls through, everyone suffers. So it's really not about being right or being wrong, but about clarifying and making sure that your assumptions are not just assumptions. 
George Bernard Shaw said the single biggest problem in communication is the illusion that it has taken place and how true that is. Andy Malinsky said, look, cultural awareness itself isn't going to get you very far. It's not going to build that relationship, seal the deal, lead that meeting. What's really critical when crossing cultures is the ability to adapt and adjust your behavior in light of the differences that exist. So what he's saying is, it's not enough to know about cultural differences, it's about behavioral flexibility. And that's what matters, not just cognitive awareness. So I do this in my classes or with my clients using critical incidents. The dialogue that you saw between Ed and Katrin, um, the examples of hand gestures are all examples of critical incidents, just like the one you see in front of you. Critical incidents often feature a short story or a mini case study, and they often also contain some kind of conflict, miscommunication, or misunderstanding. By putting students in pairs and groups to talk about it the way you've been talking about Ed and Katrin in the chat box, thank you very much, they are able to then reflect on their assumptions and become aware of their cultural filters, while at the same time understanding and being exposed to different perspectives and different interpretations of that very same critical incident. A good question to ask with critical incidents is often, what advice would you give? Because, hey, we all love giving advice, right? And so does the students. So it's great, a great way of getting them to participate, to interact, and to really want to communicate their thoughts. Here's an, another example of a critical incident, being invited to a wedding and giving a gift because you're not comfortable that they've asked for money. What would you do? A great question to ask students when presenting critical incidents. What would you do in that scenario? Let me present to you a final critical incident. This one is something that I, I, I've um, been very passionate about because I showed this critical incident to a group of teachers once. Half the room were German, Spanish, French, British. The other half the room were Chinese teachers that had come from China to attend a conference. The German, European, British half of the room said, Ben so rude, Ben so overly personal. Ben so socially awkward. One person even said, this is a totally unrealistic dialogue. I mean, who would talk like that? The Chinese person on the other side of the room had his hand raised and waving madly in the air. And he said, you know, this is a totally realistic dialogue. And I totally can imagine this happening in China. In fact, it's also very clear to me from this dialogue that Ben is about to give Rudy a promotion. Sorry, what? Yes, a promotion. Ben is interested in Rudy as a person and therefore is asking him questions about his personal life because he's interested in Rudy and sees him as high potential. It just goes to show that different people can see the same dialogue in such different ways. Using my five-step adapt model, I encourage students to practice seeing things in different ways, starting with a sense of awareness. The first step is to ask students what's happened here and get them to describe the incident without judgment, to make some very objective comments, factual comments about the critical incident. The second step then is to not judge, to remind students to not make statements like, you know, Ben asked overly personal questions or oh, Ben was being rude or um, Ben is socially awkward. These are judgments that are not very useful in international, inter, international intercultural communication, mainly because they are filled with interpretations of, a, of an, a scenario based on our own cultural filters. So hold back those judgments and let's go to the next step, analyze. Why did Ben behave that way? Let's analyze this. Let's come up with as many different interpretations as you can of that scenario. Get students to come up with at least three to five interpretations. Perhaps Ben's very curious about new employees. Perhaps Ben is lonely, needs someone to talk to. Maybe Ben doesn't like Rudy and he purposely wants to make him uncomfortable with that questioning style. Or perhaps Ben is not very good at socializing with new people. Or maybe, just maybe, 
Ben actually really likes Rudy, and this is his way of getting to know more about him. By coming up with as many interpretations of the same scenario as possible, we are allowing students to go beyond their cultural filters and to explore the different possibilities and the different perspectives there could be out there. The fourth step of the model is to persuade yourself to align your own values with Ben's values. So Ben values getting to know an employee's home life or a holistic view of an employee. Perhaps you identify with that. I value getting to know someone beyond the professional self too. I value a holistic view of the people around me too. Align those values to Ben because this will help persuade yourself to try. The fifth step of the model is to give it a try. Now, by trying, I don't mean that you have to become them. By trying, I don't mean that you have to put your own identity aside and completely take on theirs. By trying, I just mean to adapt and be slightly flexible so that you could accommodate their points of view and understand their behaviors, their attitudes, their values and beliefs just a little bit more. Have you heard of the Pareto Principle or also known as the 80-20 Principle? It is said that 80% of results come from 20% of the causes. Applying that principle to cultural or intercultural adaptability and flexibility, we could also say that adapting 20% of your behavior could result in 80% of your desired results. Give it a try. Get your students to apply the five-step ADAPT model. And through doing so, perhaps we could encourage them to get some practice in those important life skills of becoming a more effective intercultural international communicator. Thank you so much for attending the, the, the session. My name is Chia Soan Chong. Most of my um, examples I've taken from my book, Successful International Communication. So do get in touch, Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram. I would love to hear your feedback on the session. Thank you for having me. Chia, that was brilliant. Um, I don't think just for students, for me, I was scribbling away um, ways in which I can learn from that as well um, in, uh, you know, personal relationships, business relationships. Um, there are lots of ways we, sh we can learn from that. I, I remember my first few days in, in Vietnam being incredibly surprised by the number of times I was asked as if, if I was married and thinking, well, all of these people are very interested in me. Um, and uh, yeah, th 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 those sort of things I'm sure have happened to our international audience a lot. So it's great to have some, some techniques as well as to take them into the into the classroom so brilliant stuff a very very enjoyable way to to finish um our elective sessions thank you so much for your time um a couple of things in the comments yes dan um powerpoint will be available um i believe on the website afterwards um with cheers permission um so uh I'll, we'll check in with here and then if it's there then we'll pop it up on the website uh, but do look at have a look at that book as well um it's going on my um wish list for the next uh, birthday or christmas so um great big thanks to you Chia, for your time thanks to all of our panelists we do um, have a coffee break now um so you can uh join that coffee break uh, the zoom link is on is in your where you found your other links um join the team to have a quick chat before our final plenary which will start at 3 30 um and will be uh in the zoom webinar but also on youtube um Thanks again um, and uh, everybody take care and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks.